Right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our uh, first parallel session. This is group two. Um, if you are looking for group one, that was the other link, I'm afraid. Uh, but please stay with us because we have four great papers for this particular session. So my name is Stephen Gallagher. I'm very pleased to welcome you all here to the uh, first of the parallel sessions at the Directions of Legal Education Conference of 2022. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. I think we've got, I mean, the, 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 the topics just meld very well together. Uh, they're very interesting subjects, very topical uh, um, subjects, of course, coming on from what the Dean's just been talking about, all of the issues to do with COVID and into the way that perhaps we'll be teaching law in the future. So I'm gonna give very brief introductions to our speakers. And I see that our first speaker, my colleague, Michelle Miao is here. Um, so if I just say a few words about Professor Miao. Michelle, um, you may have seen the biography. You will know that Michelle has really interesting research interests into criminology, human rights, social legal studies, and international law. She's very well published. Uh, she's been doing some really interesting projects um, and we have pre uh, presentations in the faculty and I've seen presentations elsewhere of uh, Michelle on these subjects as well. Um, I should just say as well that Michelle is a very, very popular colleague with all of our colleagues and also with the students as well. And I know that's because she invests so much time and energy, as I know many of us do, but, but Michelle has been putting a lot of effort into her teaching and I think it's been rewarded by appreciation from the students as well. So Michelle is going to talk to us about empowering law teaching with state-of-the-art technology means. So I'll hand over to Michelle. Thank you. So I wonder um, if you could see my screen. Great, wonderful. Again, good afternoon. Welcome to the session and thank you so much for attending. Um, I'm very, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to present in this really important forum of teaching law and uh, doing learning law. Today, um, the topic I'm going to really uh, present to you is the outcome of some of my personal observations and reflections about the interaction and the relation between the teaching and the learning of law, as well as technology, right? So which is a really important theme in the faculty and under the strategic leadership of Dean Wolf and also Professor Gallinger and Professor Lower. So um, today I'm going to basically cover a few different uh, specific topics. I would like to start with the change, right? So this is just to echo Dean Wolf's earlier talk topic about you know, how the society have changed over the recent years with the pandemic and also as a broader social processes. So first I'm going to talk about the seed, which I use as a metaphor to say there are some potential changes in the field. Right? So, um, what are these potential changes in particular in terms of technology? Right? So um, technology can be very powerful tools for teachers in general and law teachers in particular. So in the hands of great teachers, this technology have great potential to change and transform the way teaching and learning is conducted in the field of law. First, who is our audience? As many of you are familiar with uh, the context in Hong Kong law schools, we have two different cohorts, um, more than two different cohorts of students who have diverse but are very uh, individualized learning and, uh, um, and also teaching preferences. One is what we call the millennium. Right? So for whom I'm a member of. So this is a generation which can be called digital pioneers. We adapt to the technology and then we have to also juggle a lot of things, particularly when this generation reached the age around uh, their thirties and even forties. So they have to juggle a lot of things in addition to a career in the law school. This include, for example, part-time uh, also work as well as other social and familial responsibilities. So the demand for this generation is really accessible and efficient and uh, you know, cost-effective uh, ways of learning and teaching. 
in comparison, there is the other generation, which is called Gen Z. So this is the cohort of our undergraduate students' bodies who are just in their um, 20s, early 20s, or even uh, only in the stage of approaching their 20s. So this is the generation using one of the well-known statistics, 40% of them would prefer to have a working internet than have a working bathroom. Right? So you see the importance of internet and technology for them. Uh, I want to quote one of these phrase used uh, in one of the uh, book Dean Wolf and uh, Miss Jenny Chen co-authored about six years ago that was a pioneer in the field of e-learning. Uh, with the focus of flip classroom, but uh, they also give a comprehensive review of the role of technology in the field of law. So they call this generation digital natives, right? So this is the generation which uh, prefer really we speak in their language and we present the knowledge and information of law as well we train the legal skills tailored to their interests and preference, right? So of course, these two different cohorts have different needs, but in interesting way, they all point to the necessity really we integrate law and technology. For, it, for example, to make it more accessible for the millennials and also to make it more entertaining for Gen Z. With this um, being said, there's also a second uh, broader process which really motivate the integration between law and technology, which is the practice. The legal practice in recent years have changed a lot. And also looking ahead, we can see the future is going to change quite different in the past decades of, uh, from compared with the past decades of legal practice. We are now, quite familiar with the concept of AI, artificial intelligence. We know some of the technology has been introduced into the practice of law, such as e-discovery of evidence, such as natural language processing, such as tax mining, how the cases are searched, how this case information are revealed. All of these actually present unique opportunity as well as challenges for the future lawyers who are currently trained in our law schools. Right? So we want to make sure that our current legal education is in tune with their future needs of their career necessity, as well as the skills they need to cultivate to enable their a successful career in the practice. And the third, I would say this is really uh, what Dean Wolf has mentioned about the pandemic. Right? So I think, pandemic has really accelerated and exposed many of the issues which has long existed in the field. There was a quite seminal talk given by Professor Gallinger, Professor Lower and um, Ms. Jenny Chen a couple of weeks ago regarding how the pandemic brings the needs for virtual learning environment going digital, right? So this is one of the very unique opportunities, of course, is not limited to how the classes are delivered, but also in terms of flexibility, in terms of evaluation, and the way the teachers interact with the students. But of, of course, we all have experienced this. We know there are some unique challenges brought up by this um, you know, innovative teaching technology on the internet. Some of the including, for example, um, the tune, uh, the tune problem or the tune opportunity of freedom on the one hand, but also anonymity on the other hand. A student can hide out in the virtual environment and sometimes it's very difficult for them to turn on their cameras. And also there are questions whether this digitalization actually decrease or increase student involvement in the learning process. Some of them argue, some of the authors argue actually this result in passive involvement and not actually active interaction. So the question becomes, let's going back to the general picture, how can we make sure that it is the innovative technology being driven by teaching, not uh, the technology drives teaching? So how can we make sure that these new innovative technologies will be able to serve the best interest of learning and not vice versa. 
it is at this point, I would like to really reflect on some of the very unique, uh, you know, characteristics of legal education. So um, I, f I first want to, to talk about the three different levels of the integration between law and technology as uh, my own reflection and the observation. The first is really, um, I think the screen is a little bit. The first is really uh, technology as instrument to be used in classroom, to be able to use to aid the teacher in their teaching, right? So technology here is a formality, is a technicality. The second is technology as a content. So we have seen the emergence of many different courses which explore the interdisciplinary boundaries between law and technology. Myself, I teach one of these modules here at CHK Law, and I you know, have experience of the using of the technology and its interaction with law itself as a subject of teaching. The third is the one which I'm most interested in, which is technology as a medium to inspire changes in the thinking and the purpose of teaching in the law. Right? So what is this change of paradigms? Previous, uh, prior to the pandemic, already there has been a process where uh, there's so, ma so much available information on the internet to the extent that law schools and universities have lost their monopoly over this information. Right? So uh, our library, for example, many students do not go there regularly. They only go there for Asian textbooks and on only if it's strictly necessary for them to do so. Therefore, the purpose or the mission of a law teacher you know, has transformed from the information provider or the information transfer to the new status of skill cultivator in a way that uh, really in order to compete with this low cost, freely available channels and platforms of information transfer, law schools and universities, their competitive advantage now lies in its capacity and its best positioned for cultivating skills of students. The second is, although there are many different alternative channels for information transfer, but law school nowadays is still quite well positioned to present the best, the highest quality of learning. So I will um, particularly illustrate these two different perspectives. One is uh, the quality, the other is the skill um, training or the skill cultivation. In order to, to, to say that, I would like to very briefly mention the very cognitive uh, process of law making, which we all quite familiar with, uh, which I can say, uh, we can summarize this into basically three different stages. One is input, right? So this is an interpretation. When we see a case, when we saw a paragraph, a text, or we saw an image, our brain start to process, start to understand this. The second stage is the middle stage, right? This is a processing. This is a neuroscience according to neuroscientists. This is a process of where the reasoning and the analysis takes place, right? And the third stage is the construction, the production or the reconstruction, which is the output stage. So according to each of these different individual phrases, then we can use the technology to help or enhance the learning of law in this specifically different, but also interlinked stages of learning. Right? For example, in terms of interpretation, the one possibility for law teacher, which has been mentioned by um, many well-known authors in the field of legal research and learning is we use visual aids, we use, uh, we improve students' visual literacy. Right? I will give this a very detailed um, illustration later on. For the second, for example, use hypotheticals, use mock trials. Third, for example, to let students lead the process of knowledge production with the help of technology under the supervision of the teacher. Okay. So now I'm going to go into some specific examples uh, which I used over the past years. And the first is, uh, as I promised, is in terms of the visual image, right? in terms of the visual literacy. So um, over the course of the years in the law school, um, since I joined CHK, I have explored different uh, 
legal uh, modules and uh, which have been allocated to teach. And I found each of these courses are quite unique. They have their own characteristics. For example, there's a course regarding criminal justice and the society uh, in China, which I taught in the past an elective for the GD students. And a lot of the information are statistics, right? So in order for the student to understand the uh, learning process, what I did was I present with uh, them with the raw data in terms of all the cases and information and data in the field. The other course, for example, um, which is really focused on rules and the statutes, right? because some of the continental legal system, they focus on statutes and rules. So I present them with the rules and other um, important excerpts from the statutes. And there are also other common law courses which are focused on cases. Okay? So examples like this. This is a, a video which took from one of my courses of the first one, which is focused on the um, really uh, about the concept and the cases. Right? So this is a case regarding self-defense, not uh, introducing students to the tax, um, you know, introduction of the case, what has happened. What I did was I found this original video recording and I played that in the classroom so the student will be encouraged to discuss and also to present their arguments on the basis of the video footage in terms of what happened, how many people are murdered and what are the level of injury and why their argument could um, really move the, uh, towards the interest of their clients. And this is the second one, which is a case uh, happened in Arizona, the first case involving uh, autonomous vehicles, the, the invo involving the liability and also in terms of the accidents of autonomous vehicles. So also I found this original video uh, clip. So I played that in the classroom and then I divided the students into different groups for a mock trial. Right? So I asked them, you know, what is um, this information to you and how do you interpret, how do you understand this? So through this kind of exposure to the raw materials, I think it's the best way to let students train to develop their skills of understanding and interpreting information. These skills are strictly necessary for them after their law school when they enter the practice field. And also, I also make sure that students will have access to some of these videos, which I called expert videos, and, you know, um, benefited from one of these uh, founded teaching grant I gained years ago. So I was able to uh, introduce some of the world class experts in law to our students and let them have a virtual conversation in a way that um, they will understand some of the concept, not cases, but the concept better and understand how the historical development has been. Another example here, no one can understand the concept of the Chinese room argument in artificial intelligence better than listening to the talk of the professor who coined the term originally. Okay? So these are some of the efforts I made actually in terms of presenting different uh, visual literacy to the students. Okay. So, um, and uh, in concert with the uh, effort of producing this micro module uh, video projects, also I have introduced some of the pre class videos and post class post-class videos for the students to uh, really get the idea before they enter into the classroom. I guess this could be categorized as the broad concept of flipped classroom. So the student will have more quality time in the class and they can engage with each other and with the professor to discuss some of the most interesting legal issues. Okay, the second part, I think, uh, which um, might be related to the, the concept of uh, the student led or student driven process aided by technology is the block space created by students themselves and also the ongoing process and encourage students to uh, develop their own text, online textbooks. Okay. So this is a blog space which I have encouraged students to uh, contribute uh, on the in the field of uh, Chinese law and particularly artificial intelligence and law. And the students, uh, while they produce and also they contribute to the text, uh, the, the blog post, 
they can engage in, in, in this process of writing critical thinking analysis and also to revising and presenting their ideas. Okay. And uh, the, the other is the online textbook and also casebook, which I've mentioned, because in the field of, for example, Chinese law, the cases and the knowledge become update, outdated very quickly. And also some of these textbooks contain knowledge which are not covering every issue which are live in the field. Therefore, I, what I did was I encouraged the students to contribute like a small Wikipedia uh, web page, contribute to this and writing their own understanding of the law. And, and then we can have a database of compiling all, all of this information together so they can have accessible free, no cost, but also very up to date, um, you know, collection of ideas and also terms in terms of uh, the most updated uh, concept in the field of Chinese law. And then the last one I, which I used in the past year is really about uh, this uh, virtual uh, mock trials or the moot court, which I used. Um, before the virtual ones, I did in-person training of some of the moot court practice in, um, in, in the law school. And then I found there are some unique uh, advantage of moving the virtual moot court or the mock trials online in a way of encouraging students to interact with each other, not only the students who can attend in person during the pandemic, but also the students who are not able uh, to attend because they were in a different location and also in a way that the student will be able to share and also exchange information documents and evidence uh, you know, through the screen uh, in, in real time. It's a very effective way to improve the student's learning and it goes a long way to encourage interaction. Right. So um, I, I just wonder if I can check with the chair, how, how much time do I have still in terms? Of You're about there, Michelle, if you could just wrap up, that would be okay. great. Thank Excellent, you. right. So I think this is pretty much the essence of uh, uh, what I want to present. Of course, uh, there's also the new curriculum, which I have been developing and I will not uh, you know, talk too much about this. And uh, I guess the, I will end up on this slide, which I will say um, the, tech, the, the idea or the teaching philosophy which I developed in the past year is really not seeing this technology as a substitute, but as a supplement to what we already have in, uh, in person on the face-to-face -face interactions. Right? So I would use this technology welcome and also embrace them in open arms and also develop a holistic approach to use a synergy of different sorts of technology aided uh, instrument or tools, but also make sure that I will stay on top and check with uh, how the student re respond to it and their, how they, how they, um, how they, uh, their experience with the, the innovative experiences has been. And uh, what I found is in general, it seems these different innovations have improved uh, you know, their learning experience according to their feedbacks, et cetera, right? So I think I will stop here to leave more time for the, um, for the other panel speakers. And thank you so much for having me today. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, so yes, I, I should just explain, we budgeted for about 25 minutes. So about a 20 minute presentation to leave some time for questions at the end. And the idea is to leave questions until the end of the session. So please, anyone, if you've got any questions, feel free to chat them in to me. I think you can chat directly to uh, the speakers, but probably not while they're actually speaking. It's probably a good thing not to distract them, but uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for Michelle. I've got some questions for Michelle, but uh, we'll leave all those for the questions at the end for everyone. So thank you again, Michelle. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Alexander Spletlachini. Uh, I hope I got that nearly right. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, uh, Alexander is from the University of Macau. Uh, where he's also the program coordinator for the Master of International Business Law uh, in English Language and Academic Staff Advisor at the Centre for the Teaching and Learning Enhancement. Um, his focused research areas are in the fields of competition law and international economic law, including commercial dispute settlement. And Alexander currently serves as co-director of the Southeast Europe chapter of the Academic Society for Competition Law. So we're very pleased to have Alexander with us today, uh, even though Macau isn't that far away, um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to travel backwards and forwards for a while. It would have been nice to, to get our colleagues in in person and see everyone again. 
that Alexander's going to talk about again online legal education in the Macau um, Special Administrative Region of China in times of COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. So over to you, Alexander. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the introduction. So as uh, specified by the chair, uh, in the next 20 minutes, uh, I would like to <laughs> outline um, our um, uh, story about uh, experience with uh, online legal education uh, during the time, times of COVID uh, and also um, to discuss um, what we have learned and uh, uh, possible uh, ways of going forward with uh, uh, online, uh, online legal education. Uh, so perhaps um, we can uh, start from the like a pre-COVID uh, pre-COVID area, and then uh, maybe um, other um, uh, other participants in the audience can still remember that time when we were uh, teaching mainly in class. So what was the role of the uh, online uh, legal education at that time? Uh, in our university, uh, in the University of Macau, which is uh, <clears throat> the major full uh, comprehensive university in the Macau Special Administrative uh, Region of China, uh, where we have um, uh, undergraduate, uh, postgraduate, master and PhD uh, studies in, in law. Uh, the experience with online uh, legal education was uh, primarily um, um, basically um, encouraged uh, and voluntary uh, experiment experimentation. Uh, with different uh, techniques, with different learning technologies in order to supplement uh, in-class learning. So for us, it was um, a pilot project that we basically refer to as a blended learning, uh, where the faculty members were uh, encouraged uh, and supported by the university, namely by the Center for Teaching and Learning Enhancement, uh, to introduce different out-of-class components in order to supplement uh, in-class uh, learning. So at that time, we were uh, experimenting with different technologies, like uh, using Moodle, uh, creating new uh, uh, materials, new course materials, like audio materials, audio visual materials, and basically creating also some um, online uh, learning uh, activities for students to engage in uh, out of class. This included different forms of uh, group work, uh, forum discussions, uh, submission of assignments, quizzes, and so on. I'm sure many universities have, have similar experience with that. Uh, because uh, this was uh, mainly voluntary, uh, so the faculty members volunteered or who are interested to engage in this, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this project, uh, of course, because of that, it was not uniform. Uh, because it requires a uh, significant investment in time and probably cannot be immediately imp implemented in some basic or large scale classes, we have a very uneven uh, participation of the faculty in, in, this, in this blended learning uh, pilot, uh, pilot program. So uh, some courses mm, received a very significant blended learning component, others had a very mm, relatively modest presence uh, online outside of the classroom. And so then uh, um, the pandemic hit uh, uh, our region uh, in the second semester, in the spring semester of the 2019-2020 academic year. Uh, we had a short suspension of classes for about two weeks, and then we all were forced for the, uh, for the um, uh, rest of the semester to fully uh, switch online. Uh, and immediately from that switch, uh, it was very clear that many uh, students and many faculty members were not prepared for this pure online, uh, uh, pure online legal education. Uh, from the students' perspective, um, uh, as you remember, this was the period uh, of the um, uh, spring festival uh, when many uh, of our students who are from mainland, they have uh, traveled uh, back to their hometowns and then uh, for different reasons, due to lockdowns, travel restrictions, they were unable to return on campus. So we had only part of the students present on campus. Others were in a very different location with a very different uh, uh, you know, internet um, coverage, internet quality, different uh, access to, dif uh, to um, things like uh, webcams, uh, laptops uh, and uh, microphones and so on. So it was uh, very challenging for students immediately to adapt uh, to the classes online. The same, the same goes for the, uh, for the faculty members. Um, and so 
university um, uh, encouraged faculty members uh, to try to uh, pre-record or record their, their classes in order to uh, allow them students who for some reason uh, could not follow it in the live format still to access these um, video materials and still learn uh, from, uh, from, from the class. So in the beginning, it was a quite a chaotic, uh, chaotic move to online legal education, but then uh, steadily and slowly, we all uh, moved online. We all moved to the Moodle platform. We all settled down in, in Zoom. Yeah, and then uh, for the rest of the semester, we continue this, um, this um, uh, online uh, legal education. So basically our move as for many other universities was a forced, <laughs> a forced move, so to say, forced by the pandemic and travel restrictions. Now, the second period in our, in our story uh, is the year of uh, 20, the, the academic year of 2021, uh, when we started after the summer much more prepared, uh, the fall semester we have returned already uh, to classes. So the second, um, the second uh, stage I would call a hybrid mode uh, of legal education. And that is for the reason that um, because of the lockdowns and travel restrictions, some of our students, especially overseas students who were legally not permitted to, to travel uh, back to, 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 to mainland and to Macau, which implemented very similar policy, they had to stay uh, in their home, home countries. So we had this um, a hybrid mode of teaching when the majority of the students were in class, and then a uh, few students still had to be present in online format. Uh, this was also uh, quite challenging for the faculty members uh, because uh, it's very uh, complicated uh, to be able to engage uh, equally in the class activities, the students who are present in the classroom and those who are, who are online because you need to uh, design uh, the teaching activities in different way because you need to pay attention to both groups of students so that um, each of them you know, feels that they are still um, contributing and participating in class activities. So that was an academic year when we, um, when we continued with a, with a hybrid mode, uh, with hybrid mode of instruction. Uh, after, that, after that period, we tried to conduct an evaluation um, among the students and um, among faculty members about how did they receive these methods uh, what they found um, successful, which challenges they encountered, and how they would see moving forward with this uh, online uh, learning component. And what we found is that <clears throat> the opinion uh, kind of uh, changed. Uh, in the very beginning, when we all moved online, um, many uh, students were quite happy that in those difficult conditions, when they were stranded at home or unable to travel and unable to communicate with their friends, they really had a fully organized uh, online environment where they still can reconnect with their classmates, with their faculty members, where they can still interact in a way, where they can still be engaged. This engagement was quite important for them during this initial period of time. Later on, when the when basically all these uh, conditions persisted, we started already to receive um, a more uh, critical uh, feedback uh, because um, basically the students uh, started to um, voice concerns about the quality of different um, teaching techniques or teaching materials that uh, faculty members are, are using. And then the faculty members also expressed the need for more technical support uh, that would help them to, um, you know, to better prepare because not everyone has such a good technical expertise, for example, as our uh, previous speaker, uh, to prepare this kind of uh, innovative <laughs> and highly <laughs> complex teaching materials. Uh, of course, uh, our university made some steps forward uh, and um, asked um, uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning Enhancement <clears throat> to conduct a training of the teaching assistants uh, who would uh, help uh, faculty members with these uh, technical tasks of preparing the, preparing the materials. Uh, so there was clearly a need to improvement on the technical side. Uh, and then finally, at the, um, at, the, at, the, at the later stage, we can see from the evaluations, uh, from the feedback, both from the students and faculty members, that they still find quite, a, quite an important uh, in-person uh, in contact, a classroom experience, on-campus uh, experience, both students and, 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 uh, uh, and the faculty members. And so uh, in the end, um, it appears that um, again, as the previous speaker has mentioned that for us, the online education was first 
a contingency plan that we had to implement due to the current conditions and later uh, only a supplement, still a supplement to the traditional uh, in-class uh, in class experience, in-class learning experience. Um, that sounded both from from the student student body and from the faculty members from the uh, from the from the colleagues and then um, uh, if we see actually uh, our statistics uh, on the use of um, a Moodle platform zoom and other um, online um, uh, educational technologies uh, we can see actually that uh, after this uh, forced move when we come back to this uh, hybrid mode and to the normal teaching uh, we can see that uh, the rate of those activities dropped significantly, almost um, by more than 50% dropped back to the pre, uh, almost to the pre-COVID level. So this again, um, bring us to the situation that those uh, faculty members who were uh, quite uh, prepared and quite advanced in their blended learning component, and they continued to carry out this uh, um, uh, teaching and learning activities online, while uh, those uh, faculty members who were still relying on more traditional teaching, uh, they basically returned to the classroom and probably uh, just uh, only integrated a few, several few uh, learning activities outside, uh, outside uh, uh, the classroom. Uh, generally, uh, our discussion in the faculty um, uh, lead to basically the conclusion that um, the style um, the, of the way how we teach in law uh, in this um, uh, discussion mode uh, or problem solving mode, uh, the materials that we are using, so we still need to use uh, basic law, basic uh, legislation laws, cases, uh, and textbooks, uh, all of this um, puts some uh, natural limits uh, on how much we can actually uh, uh, sort of move online and outsource it to different online um, and educational technologies. This, uh, this um, we find it quite um, irreplaceable, this environment of uh, debating, discussing and um, problem solving in a, in a group with participation of students and, and teachers. So uh, similarly for us, the uh, online uh, legal education was an important experience. Uh, it um, basically, um, we realized that we need to improve our capacities in case there would be this contingency plan uh, implemented, uh, implemented again. We have to be better prepared. We also are better prepared because during this period of time, uh, much more uh, faculty members have been exposed to these different uh, techniques of creating this um, uh, online uh, legal education uh, teaching activities, uh, materials. So we are now clearly better prepared. But now actually once uh, basically the pandemic subsided and we are back to the classroom, uh, we can be really uh, more selective in this sense and uh, really try to only uh, use those online legal components when it, when it will be really uh, adding a value uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the teaching and learning process. Uh, because um, what we also discovered among our student body in different faculties is that um, uh, the time that students are spending on the internet, uh, the time that they're using phone, uh, and computer have, you know, risen exponentially, uh, and even our colleagues uh, from the from the psychology department, from the education department, they also uh, now keep reminding us that we also have to think about also the ways of maybe uh, limiting the students' uh, time that they spend in this uh, online uh, legal environment, uh, in online environment. We have also noticed that during the uh, time of online uh, education, as probably many of us have noticed, the communication skills uh, of the students have also <laughs> have also decreased because uh, you know this um, uh, possibility of just uh, making a black window on uh, on Zoom and just going somewhere and just muting yourself and pretending that you are not there when the questions are asked or discussions are carried out that made a very easy escape that is not possible in the real life. And we also notice that when students are back in class, how it takes some time and also some difficulty to again integrate and create this kind of lively uh, environment in the classroom. So in this sense, we really have to remember that besides integrating and increasing the use of the new technologies, we also have to <laughs> remember about these side effects 
<laughs> and how they will um, affect the, uh, the teaching process. So uh, these are uh, some experiences that we have uh, learned in Macau. I'm sure they're not, uh, not original ones and uh, um, all of us in a certain way have encountered something, uh, something similar, but uh, I just wanted to uh, put it there as an example, which can maybe uh, lead to a, to a discussion or sharing about similar experiences. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. You're quite right. I think I was nodding along at points there, and I think the Dean had, uh, had sort of hinted to some of those points as well in his opening remarks. Uh, but yes, definitely questions to come at the end about your experience uh, to do with, with taking things online as well. And now sort of, again, following on, everything linking together, uh, we have some of our colleagues from the University of Hong Kong uh, to join us. Uh, so four of our colleagues from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, the first is, of course, Professor Alice Lee, who we know very well uh, at CUHK Law because, of course, she's been helping us with our property law seminars in the past as well. So nice to see you again, Alice. Uh, and thank you very much. I won't do too much of an introduction, if you don't mind, because in the interest of giving please you as much ahead, speak as possible. Also, also, of course, we have uh, Julian Jen, a principal lecturer from the Department of Professional Legal Education. Uh, Mr. Vicky Lau, a principal lecturer of the Department of Professional Legal Education as well. And Ms. Phoebe Wu, who is um, a graduate of the BA and LLB and the PCLL and has been working uh, with Professor Lee on various projects as well. So if I hand over to, to Alice and the team, uh, then we'll give you as much time as possible. Thank you, Alice. Thank you so much, Stephen, for the very kind introduction. So yes, there are four of us because we have been collaborating on this project for more than a year now. So I think we will all be sharing our three things. Actually, today we want to share first our experience. Second, we want to share our evaluation. And third, the possible potential development of virtual teaching and learning in particular for law, of course, because we are all from the law faculty. So as you can see from our screen, this is just a bit of background, um, what we did and why we did it. Since the end of 2019, universities in Hong Kong, I would say not just in Hong Kong, I'm sure in Macau, the rest of the world, everywhere, we switched to virtual teaching and learning because we had no choice. We could not just see our students as we wished. So we wanted to share some of our experience in Hong Kong and in particular at the University of Hong Kong. So at the University of Hong Kong, some of our courses were conducted entirely virtually. That means we don't even see the student once in the whole semester, but some were taught on a hybrid mode. So in other words, teachers, they explore different online software, different tools and different modes to engage students virtually. That means uh, at Hong Kong U, teachers, they were given the choice, they were given the discretion to decide what they want to do, how they want to do it. So we don't really mandate, except for the large group lectures, we think that it is not safe to meet face to face. So that is why all the large lectures had to be done um, virtually. But for small groups, we had a bit of flexibility there. Uh, so that's a bit of the background. So maybe the next slide, please. Uh, since there are four of us, so we will have uh, Vichy controlling the slides for us. Thank you, Vichy. Um, so here on the slide, you can see that we, as I said, we have uh, choices for teachers. They can decide, um, design their own um, curriculum and also their own pedagogy, of course. So therefore, in terms of big group lectures, um, some teachers would choose to pre-record. That means they would not do it live. They would just play a video and some would choose to do it live, like what we are doing right now, a live webinar. And so we need both software and hardware to do this. And so for software, for example, um, we have tried things like Camtasia for um, especially particularly good for editing pre-recorded lectures. And also many, I think most of our colleagues have used Panopto because Panopto has very good editing functions. And also there is a function called Panopto Quiz, which is very good for engaging students while they are watching the recording. So that means the teaching can still continue. The interaction can still continue, even if they are just watching a video, a recording. So that's for the large group lectures. For small group tutorials, then mainly conducted uh, through Zoom. That's our preferred uh, software or channel. And also we realized that there are different Zoom functions to engage students, such as breakout rooms, such as um, chat, 
like what we do uh, for this webinar. And so we realized that there are things we want to find out because we want to know whether teachers are comfortable with these new technology. Uh, for example, as we learned from um, Professor Michelle Mao's presentation, of course, our ideal is to actually shift from uh, information transfer to skill um, teaching. But that's an ideal. I mean, how can we achieve it? Are teachers qualified I mean, or equipped to do what they wanted to do now? So that is why we actually try to explore the different softwares, hardware possible available. So maybe next slide, please. Now, so that's why uh, in our faculty, we try to, to provide as much help as possible to our colleagues, because we realize that there are different, not just different cohorts of students, there are actually different cohorts of teachers. Let, let me tell you, in my faculty, we have different generations of teachers. I mean, some of them who were my teachers when I was a student, so you could imagine that they are, um, I mean, not as tech savvy as um, Michelle or Alexander. And therefore those very senior colleagues of ours, they would need a bit of help. And so we try to find all possible available resources for our colleagues, especially the, the, the other generation, I mean. And so we did something to help them, such as we have um, done some introduction um, sharing to share some basic Zoom functions, not just um, teaching staff, but also our faculty IT staff, we collaborate. So we uh, conduct workshops. We actually do some recordings to help colleagues mm, uh, pick up these new uh, technology. And also we have, as I said, workshop. And so we have trial run um, by uh, tr a training run by experienced uh, uh, colleagues for both full-time and part-time tutors because we also have a lot of part-time tutors i'm sure at home uh, at cuhk you also have a lot of part-time tutors part-time teachers or in macau you also have a lot of part-time tutors and teachers and they might also need the help because they are not part of the te the full-time staff uh, team so they need to be also informed what is available? What is the student's reaction to this kind of um, engagement tool? So we actually have to take care of both the full time and part time teachers. And also we have recorded some video clips to teach teachers to teach instructors to make them understand that is a different world now that we need to collaborate and interact with students in a different mode. So we even set up a studio at the faculty. It is a permanent studio now for colleagues to do all sorts of things to record their lectures or to do webinars like what we are doing right now. So there is a lot of infrastructure changes being made. Maybe the next slide. And so that's the um, experience sharing. But we also want to evaluate the experience. We want to evaluate and find out how we can do better. Have we done enough for our colleagues and for our students? So that is why the four of us, that is um, Julianne, Vichy, Phoebe, and I, the four of us, and also some other colleagues, we apply for a teaching development grant. So this teaching development grant is basically to achieve three things, three bullet points on the screen. First, we want to evaluate the effectiveness of virtual teaching and learning in the COVID period. And we chose to do it through questionnaires and interviews so that we can recommend something for the next generation of teachers, hopefully. Second, we also have collaboration from students, teachers from different faculties, um, including not just law, but also social sciences and engineering. And we also involve different universities, including CUHK. Actually, I've been working with Jian Li because he is teaching intellectual property as I do. So I also invited him to collaborate with me. And also NUS, we have another intellectual property teacher, David Tan, who is our co-investigator. And also Melvin Yu, we have a former colleague, Brendan Clift, who is working there. So we try to find out what we can learn from each other, basically. And finally, we want to involve students in the whole process, in the design of the questionnaires, in the interviews, and also the sharing of the results like this webinar. And so that is why Phoebe, who is our former student, and she is actually now a PhD candidate at Cambridge University, uh, sorry, at Oxford University. Uh, and then she is now um, uh, trying to actually uh, uh, help us with the design of the questionnaires and conducting interviews and also sharing the um, survey results um, with the wider community. So maybe I'll hand over to Phoebe now.
Thank you very much, Alice. So in terms of the questionnaire, so here's the progress that we have gone through. The questionnaire is divided into three stages. First of all, we design the questions. So basically in designing the questions, we students and teachers from different faculties were in fact consulted. So the point is that we wish to join together teachers and students from multiple faculties to gather different opinions in order to come up with questions that are relevant to all disciplines. And then as for the distribution of the questionnaire, it is through email distribution. Some teachers also very kindly offer to disseminate them through course websites and to invite their students to fill in the questionnaire. And then after we get all the questionnaires prepared for the pilot study, the point of having a study is that because we have the questionnaire, but then we wish to know how comprehensive our questionnaire is before we disseminate to students to, of all faculties. We would like to start from the Faculty of Law. And that's why our questionnaires have been distributed to the Faculty of Law, both undergraduate and PCL students. The PCL program is in fact a postgraduate program for students before they get the qualification of a lawyer. So the PCL program is something like a postgraduate program at the Faculty of Law. So let's go to the next slide. So here is a glance of our questionnaire. As you can see, there are different formats and styles of question. We have uh, multiple choices, we also have short and long questions. So the purpose of the questionnaire is for us to understand what students find about online learning. As you can see, we have questions about how students evaluate online learning, whether they find it helpful for teaching and learning. And we also invite students to offer opinion as to whether there's any room for improvement in the coming academic year. Because as we all can, will anticipate, online learning may not be something that goes mainstream, but then we believe that online learning can be something helpful. Perhaps teaching may be a way out. So we would like to know what students find so that the school teachers and students can all find a solution that helps both parties. And next slide, please. So these are the results of our questionnaire. The results we got are pretty positive, as you can see. Many students found that online learning is very helpful to them. Uh, we indeed we also ask students why they find it helpful, and as I will explain later, that's why we have interviews to understand students' views more deeply. And the questionnaire is basically for us to get a bird eye view of how students find online learning generally. So let's go to the next slide. So we also got some pretty good long answers from students. So as you can see, these students said um, online learning is very, she finds, he or she finds online learning helpful because he or she wouldn't miss any lecture and all the recordings can help her to revise. So she's able to catch up with the syllabus. So these opinions are in fact helpful for both teachers and students to not just only review their own learning and teaching progress, but also for the school to design um, pedagogical uh, methods that are suitable for future teaching and learning. So let's go to the next slide. So here we come to the point about interview. So what's special about our interview is that I, as a student co-investigator, will work as an interviewer. So in our project, 30 students will be interviewed for the study. So the interviews were either conducted face-to-face -face or via Zoom because of the pandemic. So the interviews were in fact held last year. So the pandemic was pretty serious at that time. So some interviews were held Zoom. Students, uh, student interviewers were given a choice, in fact. So here are my personal observations from the interviews. So most students opted for Zoom interview, but then I personally found that face-to-face -face interviews were more helpful in the sense that I, as the interviewer, find it easier to interact with the student interviewees. So we have more physical touch. I was able to ask more follow-up questions. And now, you know, when we go online, most students are pretty, I, mean, I don't know, maybe they're busy. So when time is up, they just say, oh, I have to go. I, I need to switch on my laptop. Then they just go. But then if I was doing the interview with the student face-to-face. -face. We can still chit chat a bit after the interview, we we're able to do some casual talking. So it's more easier for me to establish a closer and friendlier relationship with my student interviewees. So it seems to me that face-to-face -face interviews more, are more fruitful and I was able to get more opinion and more different views from students when the, inter when the interviews were conducted in person. 
And I also make a remark here, some students who were being interviewed on Zoom, in fact, refused to turn on the camera. So uh, it's, not a, it's not so helpful in the sense I can't see the student's face. No, I can listen to them, that is fine. But then the experience is better for me when the interview was conducted in person. So let's go to the next slide. So just to share some interview questions that we asked. So basically there are follow-up questions based on our questionnaire. So we will ask the students to elaborate a bit as to each learning component, for example, how they found Zoom, whether they find it helpful, some specific functions like breakout rules, panoptophys. The purpose of the interview is to get more in-depth information from students. So from the questionnaire, we found that students find online learning either helpful or not helpful. And for the questionnaire, uh, sorry, for the interview, we'll let like you go deep into the reasoning behind. So why students will find online learning helpful or not helpful? What are the views as to the future direction of online learning? So for the interviews, each of the interview is, uh, was helpful, like half an hour. So within this half an hour, I will give students the opportunity to express their opinion, to share their experience, for example, any examples that they recall from the lesson, from the interactions with teachers and classmates as to, to which that their feelings about online learning are being formed. So this is the purpose of the interview. So as for the interview results, so this is a table that I made to summarize what I gathered from the interview. So we have mixed opinions. So while some students found that online learning is pretty helpful, as you can see, many students found these online learning tools very positive, especially online, uh, especially Zoom chat, because students found that it is a very helpful function that allows them to raise questions. And now many students told me they were pretty shy to ask questions when they uh, when they attend lessons in person. So Zoom chat provide them a very appropriate and convenient platform to ask their students questions, to ask their teachers and fellow classmates questions. So in in terms of online learning tools, many students found online learning helpful, but then some students also held very negative views about online learning because they, they personally prefer, they prefer things to be distributed in hard copy. They would like to interact with their classmates and teachers in person. So the interview allowed us to get a different opinion and to allow, I believe, will allow the school to cater the needs for different students in the future. So, so more interview results. So many students um, have actually indicated that they did not attend any lessons in person during the hybrid teaching period. So as a bit of background, our university, our university, that's Hong Kong U, offered a period of hybrid teaching when the pandemic is less serious sometime in the previous two academic years. So um, the purpose of the period is to allow flexibility for students to opt for either uh, attending lessons at school or at home. So the purpose of asking students why or whether they attend, attend any classes in person is to understand how they found different learning styles. So many students did not attend lessons in person. So many of their reasons are perhaps uh, is inconvenient. They prefer um, self-learning. Many of them Commuting, commuting time is one of the major concerns. And for those who did attend classes in person, they reflected that they, they, they are able to learn better when they are able to interact with teachers and classmates in person. So the next slide. So overall for lecturers, many students prefer online. For PCLA students, these are students who are lawyers to be, they are studying in order to become a lawyer in the future because they learn more about skill, learning skills. So perhaps they prefer lectures to be held face-to-face, -face, especially for things like advocacy. You know, it's hard when you advocate online, you, you can't really read body languages. You can't really interact with your client in person. It is something that students may actually prefer. That, that, is, that may be the reason why students prefer doing the lessons in person when it comes to skill-based learning. And for small group tutorials, most students show the preference to, for tutorials to be held face to face. I believe that it is because for small group interactions, it will be more fruitful if students can actually talk to their classmates and also discuss with them in a classroom setting than in perhaps like 
a Zoom breakout room. So for small group tutorials for both for graduate and also undergraduate students, there is an overwhelming tendency for them to prefer face-to-face -face teaching. So I'll now hand the time to Vichy to talk about other components of our project. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, so after we've obtained all these insightful findings from our project, we wanted to share what we have found with other colleagues. So in the Faculty of Law in HKU, we actually organize regular teaching and learning seminars for our colleagues. So we use this opportunity to organize a webinar to share our findings with other teachers so that they can take these into account when planning their future e-learning or online teaching activities. And as it turned out that, um, as you all know, in the at the beginning of 2022, um, we have the second uh, another wave of COVID. Um, so it turned out that the second semester uh, was wholly conducted online um, at HKU. So hopefully our, our sharing had helped help um, other teachers uh, to better prepare for that. And in our sharing webinar, after that, we actually organized a help desk session by our IT colleagues to help to answer any te technical questions that uh, our colleagues may have. As Alice mentioned, not all our colleagues are as tech savvy as um, we, we hope they are. So we would like to give them appropriate technical support. So we provide um, IT help desk um, sessions for our colleagues from time to time as well to better equip them. As for our future plans, so our project and our findings have definitely uh, helped us uh, on our future planning on e-learning activities. And we want to share all our experience and what we have learned with other teachers, not only in law discipline and not only in HKU. So we certainly think that our experience, uh, our expertise are transferable to other uh, disciplines as well, and definitely um, can be um, transferred and be shared with other institutions locally and also internationally. So, what what is our plan? So, as part of the as uh, the, as part of the deliverables for our teaching development grant project, um, one of the um, key deliverable is that we are in the process of producing an online menu of e-learning tools. So we will be including some tutorial video clips on useful um, online learning tools uh, like Camtasia, some tutorials on how to use the editing functions and on some Zoom functions that we find really helpful to engage students. And also, for example, how to use Panopto Quiz, how to prepare for that to better engage students doing online learning. We will also be including some practical tips on pedagogical design and planning uh, on e-learning activities, um, which is partly informed by the findings of our project as well. Um, and also as part of the other plan is that we will be organizing a cross-institutional larger scale teaching and learning webinar or a symposium type of webinar that we will be sharing information, our, exper our experience and also resources with uh, other teaching practitioners locally and also internationally. And we will also use this, like to use this opportunity to explore um, things like virtual teaching exchange, for example, and also transnational um, teaching so that we can um, like share information with other institutions as well. And all these will be very exciting initiatives and uh, opportunities. And we will also be working closely with HKU Center for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning to organize more seminars. Uh, one of the aim is to evaluate the effectiveness of our online e-learning guide, e-learning manual that we'll be pro uh, producing. We would like to hear what our colleagues feedback would be so that um, we can continue to improve that. Um, so ultimately our aim is that this is a continuous effort and we are looking to improve our e-learning guide so that it can be useful for other colleagues in Hong Kong and also around the globe. And hopefully that can also be useful for teaching uh, training purposes as well. So I think that concludes our presentation. Um, yeah, thank you um, very much. I, uh, I just wanted to add that I will yeah. be taking the Q&A at the end, but I think just one last word before we end. The reason why we are sharing mm. our findings on online teaching is because we find that actually some aspects of learning can actually be done online and actually works well. And it doesn't actually have to stop after the pandemic. And we would like to introduce the ways where 
online learning will work well so that we can also adopt them in the future. And that's why we are taking this further, uh, this project further and not limiting to uh, online learning in the pandemic uh, as, uh, times. So I think uh, that's the end of our presentation. And as I said, I will take Q&A at the end um, and hope you find uh, our uh, presentation useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julian, and uh, all of the team there uh, for squeezing so much in into the time as well. So thank you very much for doing that. And I do appreciate the fact that you know, you'll be there at the end for the questions, because I've definitely got questions for you as well. Thanks for the idea of sharing everything as well, because I think there'll be many people who will be interested in the results of your of your research uh, in this particular field. So again, following on in the same field, um, just to by the way, say again, questions, please chat them in. I've already had people chatting some questions in on the presentation so far, but please feel free to chat them in to me and then I can uh, uh, pose them to uh, our panelists at the end, or of course, probably be able to unmute you and ask your own questions. Uh, but our next speakers, again, we've got a, another team uh, and uh, this team then are from Malaysia. Uh, so again, very, very quick introduction, if I may. Um, our first speaker is Batari uh, Sophia uh, Amianuddin, uh, who is a senior law lecturer, program director for the Master of Laws program and chief project, project officer for the Center of Industrial Revolution and Innovation at Taylor's University. Uh, we also have Lavinia uh, Panchalingan, uh, who is um, uh, again uh, at the Faculty of Law in Multimedia University in Malacca. Um, and um, again, a passionate academic. I like putting a passionate academic in there as well. That's always a, a good thing to see for all teachers. And then our, um, the third member of the team today is uh, Laxmi Devi, uh, again, a passionate young lecturer um, who is at the Faculty of Law in the Multimedia University as well. So our three members of the team, uh, again, if we can try and keep to the 20 minutes, but this is, this is sort of moving on now, reimagining the future of legal edu education in the metaverse in Malaysian law schools. So please, over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Stephen. Uh, it is indeed an honour for three of us to be presenting our insights with regards to the future of education in the metaverse with the catchword here in today's time with regards to a Malaysian law school. Uh, my name is Putri Sofia Amir Nudin. I'm a senior lecturer at Taylor's University and um, Lavinia and Laxmi have reached out to me via LinkedIn. So hence this collaboration where we would like to provide a uh, perspective in terms of Malaysian Law School from MMU, which is based in Malacca, and also Taylor's University, which is an, another state which is based in Klang Valley. Uh, so uh, it, two years ago, when we conducted a research with regards to the number of Malaysian Law School, there are approximately 20 institutions, which consist of public university, private university, private college university that's offering uh, legal education. So based on these 20 uh, institutions that deliver legal education, we'll also assess the method in terms of the delivery and also the assessment. So prior to the pandemic, we noticed that most of the institution, they do have moot court, they do have lecture halls, they do have uh, legal clinics. So we want to assess whether all of these facilities that have been provided is sufficient to cultivate law students' soft skills to prepare them for the future world of work. And the data, we use the sample size of all students at Taylor's University. Uh, we managed to gather about 300 respondents. And the research found that based on the facilities that we have provided, all these libraries, uh, co-working, a uh, collaboration space, student feels it's not related to their soft skill at all. So essentially, with or without, they still can learn the knowledge, they still can cultivate the skills even outside the institution. So hence, we re-strategize our approach to ensure that as a backup plan, uh, because in Malaysia, every year we'll face this issue pertaining to haze, very bad haze where we need to close down all educational institution. So therefore, at Taylor's University back in 20, 20, 2028, sorry, 20, 2008, we have introduced a one week of purely online learning so that students have the experience
to learn 100% online for one week and the remaining uh, 13 weeks, it will be in person. So when a uh, pandemic happened, so we had to immediately shift from uh, blended learning mode to purely online learning. Uh, at Taylor's University, there was a little bit of hiccups because we do we are mindful that different lectures they have different uh, IT competence. So we do conduct trainings. Uh, students are familiar with online learning, but of course, different lectures got different st strategies. That's where we have sharing session, not only uh, for the internal staff, but we also have sharing session with other educators from other education institutions just to share. Uh, and assist each other how to go about with online learning. So utilizing online learning at Taylor's University, uh, we try to introduce various interactive strategy because students were feeling lost when it comes to 100% online learning. So suddenly students are not switching on their camera. They're not sure if they should switch on. So that's where we introduce uh, various activities like virtual speed dating. It's actually a networking activity. Uh, we utilize a lot of educational technology such as class point and feedback food. Uh, we managed to get law firms to provide opportunity for virtual internship, virtual experiential learning. So all of this works to a certain extent because again, it depends on the student's own initiative if they want to be part of the online learning. But now, since we are uh, transitioned into the endemic phase, so what's next? Uh, we are talking about Agenda 2030. We're talking about sustainable goals. But at the same time, we are going back to the previous normal uh, where we want students to return back to campus instead of online exam. We want students to sit in the invigilated exam, uh, utilize the exam booklet. So now we're talking, instead of answering online, you're utilizing hundreds or if not thousands of papers, whether or not these are all sustainable. So that's where the curiosity comes in. And the idea of why not we explore the efficiency of metaverse, whether or not this is something we can integrate with uh, current existing facilities to ensure that hybrid learning can be much more effective. But then the issue arises, what is metaverse? Everyone is talking about metaverse, different person with different intention, different institution with different objectives view metaverse very differently. So there are plethora of metaverse platforms. There's not one single platform which integrates all of this uh, uh, facilities. So I usually consider all these metaverse environment like their own jurisdiction. So they have ju own jurisdiction, own regulation, uh, own activities, uh, own currency, uh, which makes metaverse to be very fascinating because this is environment where not only individuals uh, as a person or employee working on organization or students uh, learning in education institution, it's a platform where they can engage uh, to learn new knowledge as well as socially interact with others beyond borders. So there is no decisive definition as yet what metaverse means. One point of view, one school of thought will view metaverse as a, a hybrid between the use of virtual or reality together with augmented reality. Again, it depends on the type of gadget that you use. But if you use like uh, in terms of a HoloLens or if you use Oculus, you will be fully immersed in the metaverse environment. So you can say that metaverse provides a purely virtual environment where you can conduct a business uh, trade or even go beyond than that. But there's also a jurisprudence that say the fact that you're using internet that you focus your attention towards that particular screen, it can also be considered as a metaverse. So there is no uh, decisive definition of what metaverse. It depends on what you want to use, to use the metaverse for. So there are research has shown that there are seven categories or seven layers of metaverse. Most people will think that metaverse is a platform where you play games. That's just the surface. It's where people, instead of your physical form, you appear in an avatar form 
And believe it or not, the face of the avatar can be exactly your face because of the technology used. I also have my own avatar. You just look at the camera and then the camera will scan and then suddenly there's a avatar look exactly like you. So this is where you can interact, have meetings on Metaverse environment, but it won't be as fully immersive if you're just staring at the screen. So that's why me and my other colleagues, uh, we got our own Oculus. So when we wear this, you will be surprised how immersive the environment is that when I sit on my physical chair, which is not that attractive, but in a virtual environment, I can select the hotel, I can select the law school, I can select the facilities. I, can, I feel very luxurious. The fact that I can sit on that particular chair, uh, I can choose to have a meeting uh, nearby the waterfalls because of the audio which is near to my ears. So I can feel, so I can hear the, the waterfalls flowing. So you feel it, it changes your perspective. So that's what it got me thinking. Imagine if you can conduct lectures here, the students is totally going to change their mind in terms of how they learn law. And of course, there are various stages of metaverse. Again, depends on what you want uh, to do. Uh, so this is also an alignment chart, which talk about different doctrine pertaining to metaverse. This is prepared by a heavy user of metaverse, which is readily available on Reddit. So you have purists, which says that if you want to be fully immersed in a virtual reality world, uh, then you, you can opt for this uh, particular type of metaverse environment, which is horizon world. But if the purpose or objective of you using uh, for the sake of social interaction or, or communication by text messages, so there's different platform. Uh, there's two university in Malaysia that have utilized metaverse. Uh, one is using to have an environment where students can access virtual library. So it's not on law school base, it's a university wide. Uh, similarly, another university also is investing uh, to provide a social networking site for the student. So it's not focusing solely on the benefit of having metaverse for law school, but it's for university wide. So metaverse is not cheap. So that's why when we talk about the future direction of legal education, it has to integrate with other faculties. It has to be made transdisciplinary. It has to benefit other educators from other disciplines so that you can create this beautiful ecosystem where everyone from various disciplines, various industries can benefit from it. So you can get involved with um, other stakeholders uh, outside the university, uh, the professional bodies to provide insights, how it can be beneficial for the existing student and how the industry also see the potential benefit that the metaverse world uh, can carry or for their business to transition into metaverse world. I am mindful there is a lot of cognitive biasness uh, amongst a lot of people, not only legal educators, when we talk about advanced technologies. So many law lecturers, they already struggled during pandemic to learn so many new technologies. And now we're talking about metaverse, they have to learn again. So I always say to them back in 1990s, there's a thing called internet. Everyone was resisting to use the internet. But from 1990s to now 2022, no one can live without the internet. So of course, the value of metaverse, you cannot feel it now. It's, it's expensive in five years time, but perhaps in 10 or 20 years, when there's a lot of people investing on metaverse, when there is a lot of uh, IT experts who wants to provide benefit to the community by providing free platforms, free services, no code service, so eventually metaverse can be uh, inclusive uh, to all learners outside a uh, private institution. So this is just uh, my presentation. Uh, I'll pass the floor with regards to the opportunities uh, to my co-presenter, Lavinia. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Putri. Thank you, Professor Steven. Okay, so as Ms. Putri mentioned earlier, she, she explained what Metaverse is and the, the law schools in Malaysia that, were, uh, that are currently trying to incorporate Metaverse. So this brings me to the opportunities that we will have in Malaysia. 
by incorporating metaverse in legal education. So as Frederick Nish once said, the future influences the present just as much as the past. And this can be seen as how teaching law from chalk to talk, and now we are be beginning to talk of incorporating metaverse into the legal education and incorporating it in our daily teachings in Malaysia. So uh, next slide, please, Ms. Putri. Thank you. Yeah, so the opportunities now is what we're gonna be looking at. So this brings us to the discussion of what are the possible opportunities that will be available for the future of legal education by incorporating metaverse. Firstly, enhancement of student, student learning, which this brings us to where we are slowly going to move away from the traditional uh, classroom environment. Now it will be more uh, like in a virtual reality. So just as Ms. Putri mentioned, if you have the virtual reality headset, our students can actually be present in the law firm uh, experiencing and learning how to fill in procedures, uh, processes of a personal injury claim, for example, and they will actually have a hands-on experience in filling it. So it's not just the traditional law firm where you go into the law firm, you sit in, you fill in the forms, and it's very, it can be tedious, and students these days, they're not, they are looking for more excitement, more interactive ways. So metaverse being incorporated into the legal education will be a good way forward. Then the next opportunity would be active learning. So which links up to the first point. So it allows students to deal with the simulated legal transaction, which now gives them the opportunity to even collaborate with students or even interns from different countries, because in the virtual reality, they could connect with students from different countries. They could even learn different legal uh, skills in terms of the legal rules from different countries because now as long as everybody gets onto the virtual reality there is no boundaries in terms of you can only work with people in Malaysia we could actually students could actually work from uh, students from Singapore Indonesia even in Europe so it actually facilitates a much more better engaging learning process okay next slide please thank you so Based on the opportunities as identified earlier, this now will show us that legal education using or incorporating metaverse really looks very great and it looks really good. So what are the effects of these opportunities in the long run for the legal education? Are these opportunities gonna be short term or is this gonna be a long term and is it sustainable? Because as mentioned earlier, the cost is quite high and it's also in incorporates getting a good ecosystem to be able to support the metaverse being incorporated in the legal education. So few of the effects that can be raised due to the opportunity, firstly is law graduates will be more versatile and no longer restricted by traditional pathway. And this is actually a very good move because a lot of industries, especially like travel, finance, uh, music, book retailing industries, they've already moved away from the traditional uh, going to the shop, purchasing a book. Now everything is online. So by incorporating Metaverse in, into the legal education, law graduates now no longer need to go to just the uni to get access to, the digi uh, to their library because now the library can be substituted by digital library, which as mentioned earlier, a lot of the colleges and even universities in Malaysia have already incorporated digital library. And there's no longer need for lecturers just to be in campus physically. So the lecturer can even be in, in a different country, but still able to teach the students as well. And this will allow law graduates to have a better perspective because a lot of times in Malaysia, law graduates have a very traditional mindset about what they can do after they graduate. So like they work in law firms, uh, do their professional practice paper. So a lot of it, will now move away from the traditional concept and law graduates will actually now venture into other industries as well like finance with metaverse it allows them to do that and the other opportunity is new modules can be rec uh, can be introduced by incorporating metaverse so one of the examples of the new modules that can be used is the law on digital assets 
So this allows legal authority for an executor or fiduciary or lawyers to access the account of someone who's actually died or has become incapacitated to properly oversee their digital assets. So students actually learn new modules, which are not the traditional modules like contract law, constitutional law. Okay, so they, so they have more choices, more options, which in the long term gives them a more holistic education and they will be able to deal with technology when they come out as law graduates. And, and, and this shows that the metaverse can be beneficial to students in the long run. So the question now will be, what will the education ministry in Malaysia, the legal profession of the qualifying board, as well as the bar council in Malaysia think? Because at the end of the day, when the students come out, they have to be worthy for the working world. So are these opportunities beneficial to law students and legal profession in Malaysia? So one of the main reasons or one of the main opportunities that you could argue that it will be beneficial is it encourages embedding professional learning within the academic learning, which means students now will actually get the experience of having a work experience. So they have that practical experience virtually and the theoretical uh, perspective as well. So they are, they are kind of being balanced. So they are, they are not just theoretically inclined, but they have the practical uh, experience as well, which means when they come out to the law firms, they are already ready for the industry and they don't have to find it difficult to cope because quite a number of students in Malaysia, they actually find it difficult to cope. And in conclusion, uh, I'll quote what John Davy said, to gain an integrated individuality, each of us needs to cultivate his own garden but there is no fence about this garden. It is no sharply marked off enclosure. Our garden in the world is the angle at which it touches our own manner of being. By accepting the world in which we live and by thus fulfilling the precondition for integration with it, we who are also part of the moving present create ourselves as we create an unknown future. So in conclusion, reimaging of the future legal education in Malaysia using metaverse is new, but it's worth engaging it as it has potential. The future is now. Are we ready for what's next? Thank you. I will pass it on to my colleague, uh, Ms. Lakshmi, to go on and explain about uh, the challenges. Thank you. Hi, yes, Stephen, I noticed the time as well. I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Uh, usually my students will be like, Miss, you're speaking too fast. I can't understand what's happening. So I hope this time everyone can follow what's happening. So of course, we've talked about the benefits. We've talked about what Metaverse actually is. And with speaking about all these different things, we definitely need to identify and outline the challenges now. If we don't identify these challenges, we won't be able to overcome it, which means like what my colleague, Miss Putri has spoken about, like what Miss Lavinia has spoken about. And I think every other fellow educator here. Yes, I like that word because I feel like lectures are just too boring. So I don't think we should be called lecturers. Uh, as what my fellow educators have spoken about, we want to see a huge change, you know, a mammoth of a change in the legal industry, in the legal education as well. So uh, some of the things that we talked about, education, of course, like I said, all the, all the colleagues here would, would agree with me that uh, educating, raising awareness to other faculty members, as well as other faculties as well, other educators and other faculties about the benefits of using metaverse and online learning and this entire new thing and specimen that they have to get used to, it's going to take time, you know, educating someone about some benefits. And until that person totally experiences it themselves, they're always going to think it's alien, it's going to be a waste of time and so forth. So this is going to take a lot of effort, you know, uh, lack of educational research. So it's good that we're having this panel discussion because then we can actually share with other educators what are the problems that we actually faced. So having more research on what are sort of the, uh, you know, 
know, limitations. I think Professor um, Alexander as well mentioned how um, he had these things where initially everyone was for online learning and then sort of students came back with this negative feedback. So understanding and having research on what the negatives are to turn it into a positive or to eliminate it completely will be very important. Uh, and that's another thing that we talk about when we talk about education. And lastly, of course, education of the system, the equipment, the platform, it's not going to come naturally. I mean, we are all lawyers. We did not grow up with this kind of technology. Neither did our degree give us this sort of educational background. So relearning all of this, I think it's a different challenge from just reading the law as well. Uh, and that's as far as education is concerned. Uh, another sort of challenge that we have is, of course, cost. Cost is the biggest thing. Everything in the education line, it's a business. We all know it, although we don't speak about it. Uh, you know, it's all about the money. So can we afford this equipment? And it's not just the equipment to educate everyone to have campaigns running. This is going to take a lot of money uh, to also have people to, let's say, maintain this equipment. It's going to be a lot of money as well because we don't have the expertise. So you need someone who, for example, if you have a virtual headset, uh, they need to have the expertise to sort of troubleshoot if there's any issues, uh, you know, maintain that equipment and so forth. So cost is going to be uh, a huge challenge uh, as well. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so uh, one second, uh, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so let's talk about one of the most important things. Of course, as an educator, your child, your student's well-being is the most important. So physical, mental health is going to be huge. We're talking about physiological, physical, psychological as well. So what do we mean when we say physical? Of course, even now, just staring at a computer, no virtual, nothing, no de extra dizziness, nothing, and you're already having sore eyes. Um, you know, holding the mouse in one position for too long, you're already a good candidate for carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, which my uncle has already got for surgery, uh, because that's how long you'll be just in that stagnant mode and you're waiting to just close the tab, move on, no one class anymore, you know? So these sort of things that we already have, psychological is of course, because whenever you're going to have this online thing, you're going to have tiredness, you're going to feel like your workload is more because now everyone can reach you 24 seven. Those days people, have to only go to work on a Monday to check the email. Now it's on a smartphone. You can never run away from work. So let alone for a student who can't do the same thing. So even when they want to take a break mentally, it's actually really exhausting because everywhere there's a bing, there's an alert, there's a ping, there's something going on, you know? And introducing the sort of online environment where they're constantly engaged, when do they actually switch off? When does your mind, you know, like that TED talk become bored for you to really create, uh, for you to learn, you know, for you to have that backlog? And that's kind of an important question that we definitely need to address when you sort of bring anything. It's about, it's all about the physical and mental health, especially in this era with the younger education, uh, and, sorry, with the younger children aware and having education on these particular matters. And of course, privacy is a huge issue. We talk about it uh, when we talk about data protection law. I think in the UK, we have it. EU is one of the biggest ones as well. Uh, so we have the G GDPR, we have data protection. In Malaysia, we also have PDPA uh, uh, and uh, in Singapore, we have it as well. Uh, uh, and yeah, you know, all these places where, you know, in reality, we wouldn't give this much information. But now that we are online, all the information is there for the grabbing. So who's using this information? How long can you keep this in information? When does it expire? Um, these sort of questions are huge, you know, especially when you're dealing, although it is adult learners, they are still learners, they're still within a student capacity. So what kind of information is available outside, you know, and of course, we know that as you know, people who use the internet, uh, data itself, it's basically the, you know, money or the currency of everything that runs on the internet. Your data is being sold all the time for you to have targeted ads uh, and so forth. So this is going to be a huge issue that we do need to address, you know, whether you're going to keep all of this in the main university server, whether it's going to go outside because you're going to get outside help for all this different equipment and technology. That's going to be a very important question to answer and sort of face as well when we sort of build the parameters and the fence of who can access this data, who can access the student as well as the faculty data. Uh, and of course, abuse and criminal activities that comes without saying, because we know the internet, we know about cyberbullying, we know about, you know, cyber sexual harassment and so forth. So anything to do with cyber, when you have this high degree of freedom, this anonymity where you feel like 
oh, it's okay. No one knows it's me, you know? So I'll just do a little bit of hanky panky here and there. And then you will see, ooh, okay. So we can't find this guy. We can't trace this guy. At that time, there's no data protection law. Lah. Okay, we can't find anyone. Uh, but somehow or other, that's going to be, can become an issue. And when you're dealing with students, as it is when we had the whole campus rape, campus, um, you know, whistles so that we, we can prevent rape or bullying and so forth. How do we do that when we transfer it to online? And this is going to be a huge question and a challenge for us to overcome come uh, as well because obviously uh, administrators they cannot predict what everyone is going to do on these sort of online platforms uh, and go moving on okay we talk about accessibility so it took us a long time to even have accessibility uh, you know for the handicapped and so forth when we talk about physical campus what about this online environment you know if we have students who can't put on the headset if we have students who are visually impaired how do we get them to immerse themselves in this online environment you know we don't want to alienate the, them as well and uh, you know having these sort of children around how do we overcome those challenges and when we talk about equipment deficiency it relates back to the cost it relates back to the knowledge as well because we don't know whether we can get this equipment in uh, so you know my colleague at Taylor's Ms. Putri um, it's very fortunate that a private university like that in Malaysia has managed to get the equipment in uh, but coming and speaking from MMU we haven't got equipment like this in because of course cost is a huge thing getting people to sponsor it uh, you know, having the Ministry of Education to come and work with you is going to be a huge uh, issue that we speak about as well. Uh, and that's, that, that's based on accessibility. Um, we also talk about lack of guidelines. So although everything is hoo-ha, hoo-ha, it's beautiful, it's so engaging. Yes, you can create your own avatar. Yes, you can, you can touch things without actually touching them. But what are the rules and regulations? Who's going to be judge, jury, and ex executioner? You know, what's going to happen online? Uh, we talk about also developing a beneficial and sustainable curriculum. How do we do this? How do we be inclusive, yet we don't be exclusive? How do we prevent those, you know, privacy, criminal, and abuse activities that we speak about? Uh, and when we talk about management plans to maintain the equipment, we're also relating it again back to a little bit of cost and knowledge, because if you're going to have all these hosting spaces, these virtual reality hosting spaces, you need to keep these equipment. Uh, so it's not just buying the equipment, but it's also maintaining those spaces, making sure it's away from theft, making sure that it's not being abused by the users themselves, because we all know uh, sometimes people, people can be callous. When it's not your own money, it's okay, right? So we know what it's like being a student and having even, for instance, the best example, library books. You see them today, you don't see them tomorrow, you've got to spend more money buying it, you know? So these sort of uh, you know things, as far as lack of guidelines, it's important. And of course, managing usage hours so when we talk about virtual libraries and so forth how long can you be on it and if it's going to be for example now we have 24 hour libraries to allow students to have their own studying times so if you were to have a 24 hour virtual library and for example you know all of a sudden you need that that one book for the assignment uh, and you can't access it so who's going to be sitting online how are the shifts going to work with staff is it going to be an educator so even when it comes to librarians if you want to have a virtual library input uh, into the system it's going to be a question of how are we going to manage it? How's the cost for hiring this person to sit for this many hours or hiring people for shifts to sit for this many hours? And that's going to be a huge challenge uh, for us as well. Uh, so with all of this, I just want to conclude that, of course, what we're exploring today is very important. The discussions that we have today are, you know, monumental in us moving forward. We might be those one panel of pioneers that just really set it in motion and 10 years time people will be like, you know, it all started with that legal education, uh, you know, digital talk and so forth. So when we talk about it, it's really important, but highlighting these challenges. Now, this is where we're really going to go. So it's not knowing what metaverse is only. It's not knowing about the opportunities. It's all good but if we can't limit those challenges or if we can't challenge our limits itself where are we going to go with the metaverse as well so it all boils down to the risk and benefit ratio so we know it's beneficial how do we make it 100 beneficial or as much as possible uh, and i think that's what my colleagues and i really want to speak to you about and how we've been you know what we have sort of had to come to when it comes to overcoming so we thank you all for listening to us um, and giving us the time of your day we hope you've enjoyed it and it's been really really educational for you as well on how it's like to implement metaverse uh, in malaysia so thank you so much for everyone thank you very much Lechmi. and uh, i'm sorry to squeeze everyone into the time limits uh, perhaps we need to organize some uh, sort of 
specific seminars on some of these topics from our nine speakers today so we can spend a bit more time talking about these different things so i've already had questions coming in uh, please feel free to to send in more questions as well um a, a couple of questions dealing with some of the points you raised at the end by the way Lachmi. so we may come back to some of those but if we can go back to our um our first speaker michelle um if we can uh, some questions that came in for you to begin with um the first one was to do with uh, you were talking about the uh, the I'm trying, I'm trying to see on my camera where Michelle is so I can see her face. Is Michelle there? Michelle, I'm not even sure if you're there. If you're maybe Michelle will come back in a minute. So uh, instead, I'll move on to Alexander for a minute then. Alexander. If I can uh, raise a, a question that came in to you, so I'll, I'll have to read the question to you, if you don't mind. Um, there was the, you, you'd raised your research to do with the students, uh, and the students wanted the online teaching. They were quite happy with the online teaching. You then mentioned that your colleagues, uh, a lot of them went back to their sort of normal pre-COVID face-to-face -face teaching, or that's what they wanted to do. Um, did you actually find that any of your colleagues were actually were actually converted into uh, tech uh, wizards or anything and decided that they wanted to become um, online teachers? Mm. Well, I think, uh, I think the, the, the tech wizards have manifested themselves even, even before this move. Uh, so actually those persons who were, uh, like as we say, uh, tech savvy, uh, they already made, made an effort uh, even, even before, and they were quite tech savvy before. So I would say that you know the tech wizards just uh, you know just stayed there. Well, I wouldn't say that anyone um, have uh, fully converted uh, to online. We we certainly um, raised our tech savviness level, but I think that you know those persons who were prepared for it, who were into it, they they just stayed stayed there. So I don't uh, I don't see that many converts actually. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is actually for for you and the. Uh, the HKU team, but let me ask Julian for this one as well. Julian, um, the, the question is, post-pandemic, will online teaching only be a fallback option, uh, an alternative teaching tool for some teaching modules, or do you think it will be the prime teaching mode? Um, I think it really depends on the activity. Um, I think going forward, especially for some of us uh, at Hong Kong U, I personally teach on the PCL course, and it seems that going forward, um, since our classes are so large, we, we have a student body of 300 full-time students, uh, a lot of our large groups will still have to be online because given the uh, capacity of our rooms, uh, we can't sit the whole of them. But in any event, actually, even before the pandemic, I was actually personally uh, going to research on um, some um, uh, online learning, because I find, um, especially lectures, students actually prefer recorded lectures, because they can go back again and again. And I find a lot of value for this myself. And I also find a lot of um, workshops where we have a lot of students discussing something, or we, we sort of um, allocate like, like a focus exercise or like, um, uh, um, you know, uh, um, learning like that, where they are given a problem and discussing online. I find the online actually works better because you eliminate the the like the technology of running backwards and forwards in a room, and everyone is just sitting there online. You you allocate them into a breakout room and they discuss, and it's easier to do things like that. But of course, for a lot of skills. Um, like, uh, as Phoebe mentioned, advocacy, a lot of small group discussions, we still find face-to-face um, um, -face useful. So I think it really depends on uh, how the course is structured, the activities you are offering, and, and things like that. And for some of them, like uh, when I teach the uh, PCL course, I teach interviewing. I find nowadays I actually have to be, teach both online interviewing skills and in person because in the in reality, if we look at our legal world, um, a lot of uh, practitioners have also changed uh, their practice to online. Even courts now they do like online virtual hearings, e-filing. So I think um, this all this change uh, is not just temporary. Um, in order to um, advance with the changing world and definitely with the technology that our students are uh, accustomed to, uh, this will be something which um, 
I don't think just lawyers or law teachers, but I think all university or even primary school, secondary school teachers need to really be accustomed with and think about their own course and how to change. Great, thank you, Julian. Can I follow up on the uh, recording part? Because it's of great interest to me and I know the Dean's here, so I'm not sure if he wants to hear about this, but uh, <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I, I got into recording our lectures after, the umbrella movement and everything we'd, we'd started to record and I just realized that actually the students said they were a useful resource yes so I, I just kept on recording yeah but we've always left it up to colleagues I don't know how, how are you doing at, at HKU are, are you mandating recording or are you again leaving that as a matter of academic choice it's a matter of academic choice because at the end of the day um personally I actually record and edit a lot of my own videos it's actually much more time consuming than me just walking into the lecture room and just talking for three hours because actually it takes for two or three hour lecture it takes me actually a day 10 hours to actually edit the whole thing uh, to make it you know, more um, engaging for the students so I, I think it really depends on the tech savviness of each lecturer and also what lecturers prefer um, I also find that a lot of review sessions or exam uh, you know go through exam sessions I prefer them face to face anyway so I, I think it really depends on the activity. And in our findings, when we actually build our website, we also give recommendations as to uh, what activities are suitable for what tool and something like that. So please look out for our website, which will be coming soon. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be looking. We've obviously got our own projects going on as well. So we'll probably have to get together and have a chat about all of this as well. Maybe again, another seminar on this. Yes, uh, yes. Maybe I'll go back to Alexander on that. Alexander, are, are you in Macau? Are you? Do you sort of ask colleagues to record for uh, their lectures or again, is this one of those sort of controversial things within the faculty? Uh, in the beginning, when we wanted to accommodate uh, the students' needs, uh, those students who followed lectures remotely, who were in different regions, uh, the, the, the recording was mandatory. Uh, but then uh, you probably also realized that it's not the same to record like your regular basically online course when you are just talking and to prepare a professional recording that people would really reuse several times. So then we basically switched, as you said, like from the from the mandatory to the optional one. Yes. And only those uh, teachers who really have resources and time to spend on preparing a professional, short, concentrated recording, that's really uh, adds value that, that should be encouraged. I, I think that's been a sort of general response of sort of allowing people to choose, although my colleague, Professor Alan Gibb, tells me there are a lot of universities in the UK now who've made it compulsory uh, for their, their recording as well. Let, let's uh, move on to uh, the team from Malaysia, uh, because I know we're, we've got to go off to the, uh, the keynote speaker soon as well. Um, the question that came in was, um, you talked about the benefits and challenges of the metaverse law teaching is there any difference between metaverse law teaching online online law teaching and face-to-face -face law teaching the benefits and challenges seem to be at least similar if not the same although at different levels so do you think there is a difference metaverse law teaching online law teaching face-to-face -face teaching um okay uh if i can present on behalf of Lexi and lavinia so when we talk about metaverse, uh, if it's just purely looking at a screen, it will be just exactly the same as how you conduct recorded lectures. Students will just viewing the screen. Uh, but what we want to provide is to enrich the students' learning experience so that they will be fully immersed in the virtual world, provided that if they are equipped with the relevant gadgets. So in order to do so, this is where we have to make an investment to develop a lab which provide those equipments for students to be immersed in learning, especially when I teach English land law. So when you wear uh, the gadget, so you can, you don't have to envisage because everything is there. So whatever that you want, the facilities are there, you can narrow down the object. You can actually hold the object, make it big, make it small, to touch it, just to focus it on certain, how do you want to explain about uh, areas of law? Uh, things will be much more interesting if it involves that module on forensic evidence or criminal law. So this will be much more interesting because you see the crime scene as a first person point of view. You don't have to go to the actual criminal scene. You don't, uh, you, you save out a lot of time uh, on that aspect because in the virtual world, you can actually purchase all of these digital assets which are readily available. And when you plant it, on the virtual world, you can adjust in terms of the sizing to make it realistic. But as an educational purpose, you just want to demonstrate, you can resize it just by motion, moving motion 
to, sh to show an example to the students. So we have actually uh, experimented with Engage VR platform. Uh, there's a lot of uh, improvement needed because especially when we use all the VR headset at the same time, we're supposed to mute ourselves just like how multiple students will uh, unmute themselves on Zoom. You can hear a lot of noises. So a lot of briefing are required, not only to the educators, but to the students on how to utilize and fully reap the benefit in the metaverse world. Great, thank you. You've just given me a great image now that you're going to be teaching English medieval land law using virtual reality. That's, uh, that's the future. Uh, Michelle, uh, if I can go back to you, um, a question came in for you. You talked about um, uh, the sort of tech and law integration and the teaching of law using technology, but you didn't mention law teaching by machines. Do you see any future for artificial intelligence to take over teaching law? That will certainly be a threat to all of us, this community of legal educators. Okay? Um, and again, apologize just before, and I could hear you are commenting saying, where is Michelle? Are you still there? But I, um, because the limitation is an evidence of the limitation of technology, right? I, I cannot really communicate to you. So, um, so basically, I think there is certainly a possibility, you know, in the future, um, artificial intelligence not only will have impact in the field of legal practice, but also in terms of legal education. Right. But uh, I think we are so precious at uh, this community of legal, legal educators. There are something that um, cannot be replaced by artificial intelligence, at least in the short run, which uh, is really, um, I mentioned also before, in terms of the quality of teaching, right? This is a teaching of law uh, using the title uh, Dean Wolf has um, published the last year, the book, The Art of Teaching Law. If we see it as a, a, a term of art, this is something very personal, subjective and uh, creative, right? This is, cannot be done by objective algorithms or computerized programs. I guess I'm not particularly worried in the short term will be replaced by this algorithmic machines uh, in terms of delivering teaching to all the students. But I do can, I, I can see some of the relatively uh, low grade tedious or mechanical tasks which can be functioned and replaced by some of these uh, machines as well. But it will not uh, deny our status as really effective legal educators. It will be only enrich our process and we need to also learn how to harness and how to master those kind of tools rather than acting passively and exclude the arrival of those important legal technology. That is my personal view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. I'm very much hopeful that we can carry on. We, we need humans to teach law for the future, at least for, for a few more years for me anyway. Um, uh, a, a final question because we definitely should have extended this panel because there are a lot more questions coming in. But uh, one of our regular sort of followers at our seminar, Shmuel Yerushalmi, has sent in a question, which is for the Malaysian team. Obviously, the metaverse is, is grabbing people here. Uh, so Shmuel saying, if we're reimagining legal education beyond Malaysia, what, according to you, are the opportunities for development of legal education in the metaverse around the world? Do you see this as... As the future for legal teaching everywhere, or uh, yes, I, I mean, if my, if my colleagues don't mind, I I do. Uh, coming and having an educational background in the UK, doing my master's there as well, and then coming back to Malaysia to teach, I think there's this thing where if we want to learn from each other, I think we're doing it now as well, you know, having people from Hong Kong, having people from Macau, if we have these sort of interactive, um, you know, speaking moments where we sort of can discuss and, and sort of find out uh, what was it like for you? What was it like for me? So I think the way, I think, and I think my colleagues and I will, I mean, co my colleagues will agree with me when we say reimagine, we can sort of connect the boundaries literally mean nothing uh, but using metaverse having this immersive thing you know as, as Miss Putri has spoken about as well where we have these avatars it just looks like we can be anywhere and we could be talking with different 
people in different parts of the world. Um, and even having sort of like these legal attachments, legal fads, I've been for online legal fads in the UK as well. Having that sort of idea where there's no boundaries, it's limitless, uh, would be really good because right now the problems that we face as the legal, uh, as a legal industry, legal academics and so forth, is that there's no connection and correlation with one another. And I think you can agree with me as legal ac ac academics and educators. Um, if you're a lawyer, you don't view us the same way as we view a lawyer as well. We're, we're always viewed in isolation. Oh, if you're an academic, you're just going to know the theory of everything. You're not going to know the practice. But then from a, you know, and that's from a practitioner's point of view. But from an academic's point of view, we were like, if we didn't teach you, you wouldn't be a practitioner either, you know, but having this sort of this boundary sort of broken down and talking to them and having these different integrated things on the metaverse would be pretty amazing because you don't have that thing where this is a university these are educators or this is a law firm and these are practitioners so having that sort of integration and doing this on a large world scale thing would obviously bring to light a lot of things where we can connect we can also talk about how to better our laws overall, you know, having different laws in different countries and having these sort of discussions, these talks um, would, would be very beneficial to a law student point of view, uh, as well as from an educator's point of view, when you're talking about bettering the education so that your students are ready and are employable when they do leave university. And you can only do this by sort of having that group world discussion, you know, and I hope that answered the question as well. I, I think it does, but it also probably raises a few more. And I saw the Dean sort of getting ready, but we haven't got time. Uh, just one thing, um, just to mention that uh, our former colleague, Esther Erlings, who's in Australia now, and of course organized the first one of these conferences back in 2016, has just sent in a message saying, uh, in Australia where she is, it's compulsory recording of lectures. And that wasn't, there's no smiling face after that, by the way, I should say in her. But thank you very much. That was a great session. Um, we definitely should have thought about extending this and maybe this evening when we have uh, some comments, we can discuss some more of these things if people are around. But otherwise, thank you for our nine speakers in this session. <laughs>